Well, I got my heart up in a beautiful man. I should have known better when I took the rest. So, Chuck, I want to tell you a little story before we get into this. Okay. I had Tim from Rise Against on the show a couple of months back, and he recalled a time way back in the day when his first band, way pre-Rise Against, opened up for Hot Water Music. Baxter. That was it, in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, and the thing with Chuck is, now I'm friends with him, and years down the line, I mentioned it to him. I said, oh, by the way, years ago, my band Baxter supported you in Chicago. And you said, yeah, I remember. I've still got the 7-inch. And he was like, no, you don't. You don't need to say that to be nice. <laughs> and you're like, no, I do. You described it to a T. And he was like, man, he does. Then I made a video trailer of that story. I put it on Twitter to tease the podcast, tagged you in it. <laughs> yeah. You saw it. And took a picture oh, yeah. of the sleeve and you're like, still oh, got yeah. it. And yeah. I was like, man, the internet isn't always a drag. That's one of those moments where I was like, the universe just all came together in a yeah. beautiful way. Yeah. So good. Yeah, I totally, that wasn't that long ago. I remember. Yeah, that. it was about three, four months yeah, right at the yeah. start of the year. That's cool. A man of your word. You see a man of your word. Um, we did a chat. You probably won't remember because I assume you do a lot of these. We did a chat for a radio station in London a few years back. And after speaking to you then and from speaking to people like Tim and, you know, people that have toured with you and know you, if it's not too much of a stretch, it seems to me like your life's work has been and your life itself has been a quest really for sincerity and authenticity and loyalty and friendship and family. It seems like those core values of the community that you're a part of really, you know, mean a lot to you and you practice yeah. your life in that way as a, an honoring of those things. Do you think that would be safe to say? For sure. I mean, I do my best, you know, I, I feel, I feel really lucky that, um, when I started playing music, you know, as, as a young kid, you know, it was more of just a pure rebellion, you know, it was something my parents didn't support. And I battled everyone and everything around me, you know. Um, Where do you I think that came to, from? Just, I mean, I think it's, it's, I think it's just part of uh, growing up. Every kid goes through, sure. you know, in those early, early years where, you know, you're still a bit confused as to where you fit in. You know, you're, if not completely <laughs> confused as to where you fit in. And uh, nothing around you makes sense yeah. um, in terms of what people are trying to teach you or tell you or, or, you know, and every once in a while somebody may say something that'll bend your ear enough to make you think. And But for the most part, for me, I mean, as a young kid growing up, you know, uh, religion was really pushed on me and I didn't, it didn't feel right. And so I fought the church, you know. Was that from uh, one of your parents? Yeah, 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 sure. And, you know, I grew up in, in religious and Christian schools. And, you know, I just, I fought the authority. I, I just, everything, I just rebelled against everything. And, you know, I found skateboarding at a young age and all the music that came along with it. Punk and rock, it, early thrash, hip hop, all yeah, of that. Yeah, I mean, back then, you know, I mean, we're talking like late 80s. So it was just a big melting pot. For sure, of, yeah. Beastie know, Boys, Metallica. It was Beastie Boys brains. and, yeah, Bad Brains and Megadeth and Metallica and Minor Threat. I mean, like, whatever. And uh, But it, it all registered to me and it all made sense. And that was, that was what kind of pulled me into wanting to play music. You know, I realized that there was, like, expression in the rebellion you know what i mean like you know the purpose cause, to it. a purpose yeah. you know because the rebellion i felt was extremely lonely and very you know i i didn't i felt alone and uh and i found that and i found some unity in that i found like-minded people and people that felt the same way i i would read lyrics you know that registered to me and made me feel the same way well years later i kind of you know 
not too long, but a few years later, I feel lucky that I met some people um, who taught me and showed me that like playing music and being in a band, because I never even thought about being in a band then. It was just more about, I just want to turn everything up as loud. Tapped into and that just, energy, yeah. You know, just beat on the thing until I can't feel my fingers anymore, yeah. you know? And, uh, I mean, not much has changed <laughs> in that aspect. But, uh, I mean, I, I met some people who taught me that being in a band was, and playing the music was... There was a lot more to it than just, you know, than just being in a band or being popular or being, you know, making money or meeting girls or whatever the other people, other kids that I was around were in bands. The reasons that they were in bands for, you know, uh, you know, these people taught me that uh, music was a could, was about therapy or could be about therapy you know so to me all of a sudden everything kind of turned where it wasn't so much that my mind was set on rebellion it was just set on becoming a better person you know and I mean I'll be the first one to admit I've I've made just a boatload of mistakes throughout my life you know but I can't I I look back on it all and I can't have any regrets whatsoever you know I'm, I'm really comfortable and I feel a lot of joy for where I'm at now I have a beautiful wife and a wonderful son and I love my life and I love my friends and I love the music that I'm a part of and the community that I'm a part of and I feel if I made any decision differently even through all the rotten rotten paths that I took you know in in those days that, you know, it, it could be different, you know, so I can't looking at it that way. I can't have any regrets at all. But, um, you know, when I found that, uh, playing music could, could be a way to overcome my own battles and my own obstacles, it just opened up a entire new world to me. And, uh, yeah, it changed my life forever. When you say you were sort of battling demons, was mm-hmm. it was it beyond the typical teenage angst, isolation, or was there something more going on? Were you battling something a bit more deeper and more profound? And if that was the case, was it music that brought you back from the brink and gave you purpose and direction? I mean, I can't I can't really say it was any deeper or more profound than than the the teenager sitting next to me you know what i mean every i feel everybody has um you know their their own moments growing up where they literally feel like it's the end of the world you know yeah and i think that's a part of growing up and i think it's it's important to kind of feel that and understand that and and for us to find our own way out of it you know um it's part of maturing and it's part of you know coming to realization and and becoming a a a young adult you know so uh no i mean to me you know in the grand scheme i look back and you know compared to it, it, it was all first world problems, man. I mean, compared to, you know, the grand scheme, like I had a pretty, pretty damn good, you know, I mean, I had two loving, loving parents who are, were wonderful to me, uh, for the most part. Uh, you know, there were times where they definitely didn't support what I wanted to do. And there were times where, yeah, they may have been wrong and disciplined me or, or, you know, kind of trying to uh, veer me away from something that I wanted to do that may have been not so bad or positive. But when I look back on it, especially now being a parent myself, I understand that, you know, their primary goal was just to care for me and and try to keep me safe and on and on the right track and on the right track yeah. and you know avoid uh 
pitfalls you know what i mean and i mean my mother said it when i was a kid like you i don't want you in bars i don't want you playing this punk rock i don't want you playing rock and roll it's a dark path and it'll it'll just lead you to a dark place because at that time and, it was revered and kind of it was like a threat wasn't it still music I've, then had that oh, danger I've, element to it yeah it, it was it was definitely not mainstream at and all punk rock at that time was yeah. sketchy and dangerous it wasn't was it? sketchy it was very dangerous and and very violent and uh and you know i mean i in a, in a lot of ways, I can't blame her one bit. You know, if I kind of, if I, if, if, if my son brought some of the kids home that I brought home <laughs> yeah, to my yeah. parents, I'd be like, <laughs> no way, get that kid out of my house <laughs> and you're not hanging out with him anymore. And I don't, I don't blame them one bit. You know, they were just looking out for me. Uh, but right around that same time, uh, you know, fast forward a few more years like everything started changing a little bit uh in the music uh that we were listening to and and you know more bands started uh coming out that were really you know um uh how could i say it without pissing somebody <laughs> like uh bands i feel start more started speaking for change rather than just screaming at it you know yeah. what i mean so you went and from say the germs and that nihilistic destructive kind of style to someone like henry rollins or beyond that yeah Ian McKay or and people who, rights of spring yeah, yeah whatever yeah you know something that how can we make that, things better how yeah, can we how, implement how do we get change? better as like as a whole as people you know and uh and yeah i mean it, it uh it definitely um it was definitely groundbreaking you know for for me personally but me and then this small group of friends that you know we just kind of found each other you know who were, were there bands on the local scene that were sort of your maybe idols is too much of a bigger word but obviously you've got on the national scale the you know well-known well-revered popular bands were there mm -hmm. any local bands that made a, an impact on you and showed you the way like oh maybe we can do it like those guys and they're yeah. onto something there. yeah for sure i mean you know when when we lived we lived in a small town uh you know when i started playing a lot in in on the west coast of florida called sarasota and there there were a few little bands you know but uh, it wasn't until we moved to Gainesville that, um, you know, we started, you know, hearing more bands around us and, and, and I mean, there was a ton of them, you know, uh, uh, grain and, uh, Panthro UK United 13 and, uh, um, uh, spoke and, you know, a, a lot of these bands that, that we looked up to, but in the grand scheme, they, you know, some of these bands started, you know, a year or two years before us, you know, but they, in our mind, they were, those were our elders, you know, yeah. they were maybe a year or two older than us, you know, a year's um, a long time when you're a teenager. Those oh days. yeah. Yeah. For it's sure. a lifetime. And then, but I think one band, and I mean, it's perfect to talk about it now because we have him here tonight, but uh, probably one band that made such a massive impact on us um, at an early age was Avail. Right on. Um, you know, they, they, were, they were a band that we were, we were fans of them just because they had the right message and they had the right energy and... You know, they they were just dirty and gnarly and relentless and great live shows. They had everything that we were looking for. So we were fans. We loved them. And then they would come to town and we, we would meet them. And, man, we just hit it off like nobody's business. And, and So how long have you known Tim? We're talking like 20-odd <clears throat> years. Long well, I would say uh, probably at least since 94 1994 so coming up on 25 yeah wow 94 probably um is when we first met and uh so they're from richmond virginia and later on we kind of found out that and we used to say that uh gainesville florida and richmond virginia were kind of these sister cities um and a lot had to do with some of the bands that we had met on the road and uh 
you know, brought home like Ann Beretta. We're all just brothers, brothers of ours. Inquisition, uh, of course, um, who, you know, became Strike Anywhere later on. Um, you know, Action Patrol. I mean, there, there was a ton of incredible Richmond bands, uh, but we would go, we would go back and forth and it, it kind of became this second home to us and vice versa for a lot of the Richmond folks. They would come down and, uh, you know, so, but Avail was one of those bands that, you know, we were fans of them and then we get to know them. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're kind of looking up to them as like, how do, how do we do this? You know, and they became our, our, our kind of our big brothers, you know, in the, in the music community. And we would see them go overseas and, you know, a couple of other friends, bands of ours that, that we knew of that would go overseas and we'd go, wow, can we do that? You know, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, all we need to do is get a passport and we, did, <laughs> we call this guy, you know. Well, so, you got to tour, right, just yeah. before just before the internet and cell phones really changed the whole game. Oh, yeah. And you came up in that time when you had to, I guess get credit cards and call from pay phones and like oh, yeah. map yeah. out that route. Like yeah. what an exciting time to be yeah. in a touring band. Yeah, it, it was, uh, it was exciting, but it was also, it was a ridiculous amount of work and it wasn't always pleasant at all. I can you believe know, it. It was constantly exciting, but you know, we, you know, we did the first few tours, um, through we had no agent we we booked everything ourselves and there used to be a book uh that used to circulate called book your own fucking life i don't know if you remember that book uh but it was basically like the internet before the internet it was it was uh, almost like a phone book of all the all the venues all the uh promoters and even crash pads pr- crash pads yeah. restaurants you know, safe places, you know, uh, you know, for punks. And, and we used to just go through that book and we'd go, okay, we need a show in Atlanta. And then we'd go down and be like, okay, car versus driver house. All right, call them up. And sometimes it would take 12 phone calls to, cause not everybody had answering machines either back then. That's it. Yeah. So some people did, or you would leave (laughs) a message and then whoever, whoever you were calling happened to be on tour for eight weeks themselves. Yeah. So you never heard back. But we would book, I mean, some of those first tours we would did, we did, I mean, sometimes it seemed like, you know, maybe 60% of the shows would happen, you know, and another 40% or sometimes more, you would show up and it would just be non-existent. There would be no one there and it's closed and... I guess this is it now. And then you have to just bunk down for the night and then yeah. drive on to the next place with yeah. zero or, gas money, right? Or what's what wasn't uncommon back then, I remember a story. Um, we showed up uh, in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and uh, the show was canceled. And we're sitting there, vans on the side of the road. And, and back in those days, I mean, no one, we didn't have, no one had any money. And we would just pool our money And we would go buy a couple loaves of bread and a big jar of peanut butter and a gallon of water. And that was lunch and for dinner. Yeah. Yeah. For everybody. And uh, we would just kind of do whatever we could and sit around and and have our and we're on the side of the road and we're eating our peanut butter sandwiches. And this little kid comes skating by. And I remember he was great. And I skated and a couple of us did. And he comes skating by and he sees our board and he's like, Hey man, you guys in a band? And he's, he was probably, I think he was, you know, seven or eight years old, you know, and lived around there. His name was bear. And, uh, and we're like, yeah, shows canceled and whatnot. And he goes, well, he goes, there's, there's a, a place down here my, my buddy is at and, and bands play there. He goes, you guys should play there. He's this tiny kid. And he's like, I'll go check it out. And he skates across the street and he comes back and he goes, they said you could play there tonight. <laughs> We're like, really? All right. And so the kid goes back and ends up 
drawn up and making this little flyer and prints a bunch out and he skated all around town and handed out flyers. He saved the day. He saved the day. And, and we that's played incredible. It. We played there at Hot Springs, Arkansas. But, and I mean, that was just a, it's a great memory, you know, to kind of look back on, on moments like that where we'd roll into town and, you know, there were many times like that where you would just meet somebody on the street and just by the way they looked or the way they carried themselves or the t-shirt they're wearing, you're like, they're somewhere within the realm of where we're coming from, you know, and you would end up talking to them and maybe you would find a place to stay. Maybe you'd get a show that night or, you know, or at least end up at a house party somewhere where you could get a bite to eat and a beer or something, you know. And a bed to crash for the night or at least a or floor. A floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indoors. I mean, what were some of the early tours like in terms of other bands you were going out with? You got any good memories of, you know, bands who are perhaps well known today that you would have spent time with early on and before sure. they broke too? Sure, sure. I mean, I mean, we. I'm sure there's cavernous there's, amounts of them. There's tons, you know. <laughs> any mean, that we, particularly shine? We toured. Uh, <laughs> we. <laughs> oh, I feel bad even talking about it. There, uh, <laughs> you remember Saves the Day? Of course, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, wonderful band, guys. wonderful people. Uh, we took them out on, on their very first tour. And uh, they were just all super, super young. I, I just, I mean, we were young, you know, I said. And they, they're still yeah. real small, aren't they? Like, they look like kids yeah, almost I mean, still they today. they were just super young kids and, and super green and, like, a lot of questions. And, and I mean, we'd only been doing it a few years longer, but. It's you like know. you said earlier, though, they would have looked at you guys with those extra two years experience yeah. and gone, whoa, these yeah. are the godfathers. The, the, road, <laughs> the road can age you kind of quick, you know. <laughs> But, yeah, I remember uh, taking them out and, and, you know, we'd all good fun, but we'd haze them a little bit. And, you know, we'd go to the market and, uh, you know, uh, buy buy big uh, fish and hide them in their van. Amazing. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> just all good fun stuff. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. We There was a lot of bands that you know, that, that we, uh, we toured with that, you know, we would then see, you know, just excel and keep pushing on and going forward. And, and it was, it was always awesome for us to see. I mean, to, you know, to us, we've always felt so honored to just be a part of a, a music community who, who just cares for the most part. There's always, you know, there's always some rotten eggs in the bunch. You know what I mean? As with and everything in life. Right? As with everything. Yeah. yeah there's always people that kind of, you know, they just don't get it and or they'll never really get it. And and that's fine. I mean, I think it's important to, you know, have the rough you know, with the smooth, right? Have it all. Yeah. But uh, for the most part, you know, I feel like we're a part of a community who is very caring and very understanding and you know believes in a in a better tomorrow and is willing to uh sacrifice everything for it and um you know for that i've always felt pretty damn lucky you know that i ended up here and not somewhere else I think it's pretty telling. Am I right in thinking that it's from day one, it's always been the same four guys in the band as well? There's never been lineup changes or... There was, the yeah, for the most part. I mean, there was there was one, one point in time where uh, um, we went on a hiatus and we were... Um, what had happened? Yeah, we were on a hiatus for a little bit and... Uh, we got back together and George was playing drums for Against Me at the time. And uh, uh, we had Dave Ron um, come and play drums with us. Uh, that was that was the first time there was any kind of lineup change. And we never, we, we did it totally with George's blessing, of course. And then, and then now, here we are... Um, uh, Chris Wallard is unable to be with us right now on the road. And, and uh, we have Chris Cresswell 
of the Flatliners. He's pulling double duty, is he? Yeah. And, Good and man. now on this tour, he's doing double duty. So Good man. <laughs> he's going to have to pace himself. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, and again, you know, we're... But that's still only, a revolving door where they're always in the band still and they're always welcome to come back sure, at any for point. For sure, yeah. It's all... Which is rare, I think, isn't it? Family. It is rare. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it is rare. Because life happens, doesn't it? And it people... does, man. And I mean, we, you know, we miss Chris uh, Wallard. I mean, it would be wonderful to have him out here. But again, we wouldn't, we wouldn't ever be doing this without his 100% blessing on it, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we've all kind of made that pact a long time ago. And, uh, but, you know, we release it that new record the light it up record and which is kind of ferociously good by the way oh dude. thanks man. it's so good yeah it's we so had a strong we had a great time doing it it sounds like know? it it comes yeah. across on the album we had a lot of fun um but you know it was uh it was just one of those things where we had kind of mapped everything out what we were going to do and we started you know purchasing the flights and kind of getting everything set up um and then you know some things happened where he wasn't able to to make it out anymore and it was kind of a last minute well sh- are we just going to bag all this or you know and and then we, you know he brought he brought it up he said well, well let's see if we can find a replacement and we were playing uh uh Gainesville Fest at the time and i remember sitting at the parking lot um in front of the airport and I had just heard I was on my way to Gainesville to play the next night. And uh, I had heard that Wallard wasn't going to make it out. And I'm calling George and I'm, I'm sitting there like, am I getting on this plane? Like, do I? Because I got to, you know, I have a toddler at home and, you know, a wife who wants me home for sure. And you know, if I, if we're not doing this, I need to know now. And we just said, out of hell with it. We'll just do it as a three piece, you know, and, um, punk rock. And so getting it done. So I flew. Yeah. I mean, we were committed. So, you know, I mean, we had a job to do, so we had to, so I said, all right, well, let's do it. And, and I flew to Gainesville and then somewhere between me flying from Sacramento to Gainesville, um, Jason had talked to a few guys. Uh, he was talking to Dan Andriano about coming out, you know, backing us up, just playing. And and then Cresswell, Flatliners were there. And Cresswell just stepped up to the plate and he's like, yeah, man. I'll, he's like, I already know a few songs anyway. And I think he learned like six or seven songs backstage before we walked on and played them. And then the next night... We played a second show and he learned like another four songs in his hotel after, you know, the machine show. So he just he just jumped in and was full steam ahead right away. And and we, you know, again, you know, just with it all being family, we he wouldn't have done that without the Flatliners blessing. You know, we love those guys and we have so much respect for that band and uh, you know just the fact that we can all do this together and just keep the show going make the show go on and and uh, and everybody's having a good time is pretty special you know it's a dream lineup like for you guys it's obviously the dream to tour together as old friends but for fans as well I love it like it, hap- it happens a lot at the moment you see these package bills yeah. where everything complements everything else Yeah, and it's almost like mini festivals isn't it you're kind of just yeah. taking like a mini bill on the road and yeah. taking it to the people I think it's it's pretty special to you know for the most part when we go out and we play shows uh, y- you know you're not you're not necessarily going to see us on stage with anyone that that we wouldn't be thrilled to sit down and have a cup of coffee with, you know what I mean? Like most of the people that we're playing with, we know and we respect and we love them. And, you know, to us, it's why not? You know, if you're going to put, if you're going to be that far away from home and uh, put this much time and energy and finances into doing something, 
you know, you have to, you got to love it through and through, you know, you got to love everybody who's involved and there needs to be that mutual respect across the board, you know, when you're working with someone and, you know, life's too short not to do that, you know. How is it for you at this stage then? Do you almost feel like it's a bit of a double life? Because obviously you've got, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. how old is your son now? Oh, he'll be three at the end of May. Right. And he's your yeah. firstborn, right? Only yeah, child that's at the right. Moment. So, yeah. I mean, it must, it must be tough. I've got friends. I'm of that age group now where everybody's getting married and having yeah. kids. And all the guys that I'm old friends with say that it's, it's almost unbearable being away from your kid when they're that age because they grow so fast it's yeah. like you go away for a couple of weeks even yeah and you come back and it's like a different person it's brutal at you. it's brutal yeah i mean i don't i don't do any long tours anymore uh i mean i'm rarely gone more than a week and a half for that reason uh, is it? yeah 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 for sure and it's a big reason why i decided you know to you know be, start guiding more back home. I mean, I, I feel like I really do live a, a double life in the sense, you know, I, at home, I'm a fly fishing guide. I'm a, I'm a, tell bu- us about I'm that. A, what's involved in that? Uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm a licensed, uh, coast guard captain and, uh, I run boats back home and, and take, uh, take people fishing. For, so are you t- sort of living. teaching people how to do it for the first time uh, or, is it, or is it across or the board? From I take, beginners in, I to- take from beginners to experts. Right. Um, yeah. So, and I run three different boats and I work in about nine different fisheries. Um, and how so, long have you been doing that Chuck? Well, I mean, I've been doing it for, I've been running these boats and fishing for years and years and years, but, um, I've been, actively uh you know licensed and insured and bonded and everything for about three years now and it's the full-time gig when you're back home it is i mean it is like 15 hour days wow you know monday to friday or uh yeah i mean for the most part you know there's the thing about that kind of work is it's you don't clock in and leave your job and go home like that work comes home with me because you know i um I'm, I'm always maintaining my boats. I'm maintaining my gear. I tie the flies that I, I use, you know, to fish. I'm either on the phone or I'm on email contacting and coordinating with clients, uh, pickups and meeting places. Um, you know, it's constant in the sense that, you know, there's always licenses and permits and you know things to do what i do in in the areas that that i work in you know has that Um, changed a lot in the same sense that music has and that there's more rules and regulations and red tape nowadays have you noticed that yeah for sure for sure um you know uh i mean years there's still guys out there who do you know kind of do what i'm doing illegally you know, and they're pretty frowned upon and they, they, it normally doesn't last too long. You know, they normally kind of get, you know, pushed, but I love it, man. I mean, it, it's not, I would Does it not feel like work in the same sense that touring and traveling and playing shows doesn't because you love it so much. Mm, or is it, or, I'm, some of, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it it's like does. the hardest job I've ever done in my life, wow. you know? Um, and some days Yeah, it doesn't feel like work at all. You know, you show the thing about guiding is you never know who you're going to get because, you know, for the most part, guiding is it's it's hired skilled labor. It's very similar to being an independent contractor. You know, I used to be a contractor and, you know, I did that for years in between tours and bands. I was a woodworker and I used to build homes and and for the most part, being an independent contractor, there's there's very little security in the sense that, you know, you don't have this big company or corporation that kind of kind of has your back, you know, or, you know, helps cover medical or helps cover, you know, uh, sick days or whatever, you know? Yeah. There's no paycheck coming at the end of the month unless you get yeah, out there. And yeah. Hustle you it. have to chase it, you know, you have to go. And some days it is, you're just, it's green lights all the way and easy sailing and you're getting paid and everything's working. And some days, you know, you put a hole in your boat or there's, just nothing but your engine blows up or something happens where you know everything just comes to a grinding halt 
and you have to fix it. You have to pay for it. And you, the sooner you do it, the sooner you're back up and running, you know? Uh, but in guiding, um, you never know who's stepping on your boat. So at the same time, you're also, you're, you're almost in this kind of service industry where, you know, very much the same way as, as, you know, a bartender, even a bartender or working in it. You like, you're providing a service and it's your job to, uh, just kind of accept whoever is walking into your establishment. And it's your job to, you know, take their pain away and give them the best experience they possibly can have, you know? And for me, it's, it's, for fly fishing, for fishing and, and teaching them, you know, uh, you know, how to do this and how we target these species. And, but aside from that, there's a lot more to it in that industry. You know, a lot of people, I'll say this, a lot of people, I get a lot of messages still where people contact me and they're like, how could you kill all these fish? (laughs) You know? And the truth is I release 99.9% of every single fish that comes onto my boat. You know, the only reason we ever kill any fish is, is, um, if they swallow a hook or, you know, something happens, which rarely, rarely, rarely happens. But for the most part, I'm all catch and release. And, um, you know, we, we do our best to provide as little stress as possible on the, on the fish and and it's not that i mean i love to eat fish you know but there's certain species that i believe you know are threatened and that we fight for to try to uh for them to you know grow and um just become more abundant uh but i feel like in the position that i'm in it's not only my duty to uh you know, give people a great experience, a great day, you know, just something that's going to uplift their spirits or, you know, teach them something on how we do this, teach them the art of fly casting, but also teach them, um, the opportunities that we have to make this world a better place, um, in the sense of, uh, the conservation efforts, uh, that need to be there that we're that are already in place but just need more support to keep our water cleaner to you know keep uh, you know the the ethics proper uh, to to basically sustain this all the wild places that, that we all love uh, that not as many people care about anymore you know they're they're all kind of um, in a lot of ways, out of sight, out of mind to many, many people. And they don't think about, you know, they, they go to the grocery store and have no problem buying their food yet. They don't think about where the water came from to actually grow that food. Right. Yeah. You know, absolutely. They don't think about the, the purity of the soil that the food was grown in. You know, they're just worried about convenience you know, and if, affordability whether it's going to be there or not yeah. i need that and to me there's it's there's just such a bigger picture you know what i mean and you don't really notice that and you don't see it and you don't really see the negative effects um that uh our society has on our natural world unless you're really in the natural world and you get out there in the wild you know and you know, you're floating along and you say, oh man, this is so beautiful. And then you, you pass by a little cove that has an old gas can with gas spewed all over the top of the water or, you know, an oil spill or something. And I mean, this is part of why I chose that path, um, to not only be closer, definitely a huge part was to be closer to my son, you know, when I'm working there at home, I'm able, some days I'm able to make him breakfast and go to work. And if not that, then I'm coming home and I'm playing with him and I'm able to, you know, make him dinner, play in the yard, put him to bed, 
and you know lay down with him and read for him and and and, uh small but hugely rewarding things right yes man yeah and but things that that i wouldn't be able to do being in a tour bus for nine weeks you know what i mean so um but aside from that then that is definitely the most important why i decided to choose that path but uh you know i feel that you know, there's there's a lot of positive impacts that come from any individual who kind of chooses to, you know, help protect their own environment and you know their their own uh, watersheds. And uh, it's, I mean, it's it's the the lifeblood of this planet, you know, and it's vastly important. So. I heard a thing on the radio the other day, not about water, but about rainforests and Borneo and places like that. Mm -hmm. There's a big supermarket chain in the UK called Iceland that have started removing all products that contain palm oil and saying we won't sell this anymore because obviously out in these rainforests, they're all getting cut down, burnt down. All these orangutans and, you know, entire habitats are just being eradicated so they can build these new trees for palm oil to put in everything from i don't know sweets to washing powder like it's, it seems to right. be in so much crazy stuff right. and this guy was on the radio talking about how he'd been out there firsthand and seen like the effects and i think that i mean for me because i'm not a family man i don't really engage in the way that perhaps you might with politics and social mm-hmm. change because i don't have that thing in my head of like, oh what about my kids but the environment is so I mean, without the environment, there is no human race, is there? And it's the most right. scary thing in the world, like the rate that we've been just decimating and damaging. Yeah, I mean, Mother I, Earth I think for so it's, long. It's it's hard to it's hard to even picture it. Sit, I mean, even it's a perfect example. You know, sitting in a room, you know, in a city. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's so out of sight, out of mind, and yet we wake up and and you know we have the basic needs that everyone has is you wake up and you know you you, you're thirsty and you're hungry and you need to go get it done and and you know that's those are the (laughs) those are the necessities and we don't think about you know what's happening on the other side of the planet that really affects everything that we need right here right now you know and once it's gone it ain't coming back is it that's the other thing yeah that's that's the truth and uh you know so i mean it's it's a it's a tough battle you know and it's a tough thing to ignorance really is bliss yeah <laughs> you know in the in the sense that you know the more you know and and see and kind of witness and realize um and when, and when you start to see you know populations of species just lessening and and you know, I mean, we we have an issue out out in in the uh, you know in the California Delta uh, where we are, where you know we're seeing less and less migrations of striped bass and salmon and steelhead, and then aside from that, the schools are getting smaller and smaller, like the size of the fish are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's apparent. It's like there, it's shrinking. You know, it's going away. And yet there's still a lot of people who, you know, uh, their livelihood is to catch these fish and, and people people eat them. And I'm, it's great table fare. I mean, they're great eating fish and I love them. I mean, I've eaten them and do eat them. But, uh, you know, we're all realizing now and it may be too late i don't know but we're realizing now like whoa wait a second you know this is there it's going away a lot faster like nobody ever even thought that you know yeah, there would like be a, a day finite where, where there wouldn't be any striper here well now it's it's becoming obvious that wow you know when the schools of fish all used to be you know 8 to 10 12 pounds and now the schools are all, you know, one to three pounds. That's scary. That's a scary thing, you know. And, uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, <laughs> I think, as, as you said earlier, it's, it's about making a difference on a small level. 
yeah and the immediate area around you and yeah. trying to just do your best yeah and then if everybody did a bit better then yeah that ripple effect yeah in the in the guide business we have a um uh a lot of us teamed up with um clean canteen i don't know if you're familiar with them they make stainless steel water bottles and food canisters for camping and you know everyday use um and uh and then the sunglasses company uh costa del mar who's one of my sponsors in the guide business and and uh we joined on this campaign called kick plastic right and, and the whole idea was to rid all the plastic water bottles out of our boats okay so anytime i ha i take clients on a fishing trip uh or an excursion i usually take two people and i'll normally bring anywhere from 12 to 16 water bottles bring like two cases of water or more you know and uh and um you know for the most part people would uh you know maybe have six to eight throughout the day and then on a summer day i mean all those things would be gone well we did we started this campaign and i've i've been doing it for two years now maybe a little over two years and we made a pact to rid all the plastic water bottles off of our boats and um so what we did is each individual gets a clean and sterilized you know uh 20 ounce bottle full of uh filtered water they get it at the beginning of the day like this is going to be your bottle for the day you know and and then i have uh 64 ounce growlers like big stainless jugs full of water to refill them well in the past two years um it's something by the amount of trips that i've done and what i normally take it's something like over 1500 water bottles that that i haven't used you know and everybody's been happy and the water actually tastes better it than, seems more authentic as well do you know what yeah. i mean it's like you're on a boat you want that kind of like outdoors experience it's like yeah. if you're camping you know you don't want a yeah. plastic bottle you want yeah. a canteen yeah yeah exactly and uh and i mean it just it works and it's a little more work for me you know than just w when I'm passing through the gas station or the, you know, c the grocery store to grab cases and go, but the payoff but, is that much greater. Yeah, than, for yeah. sure. And it's, it's not, it, it, it's, it's, I barely even make a dent probably in what's happening out there in the grand scheme. But you know, it's, it's just, if everybody would just do a little bit, just a little bit to make their, surroundings and make the world a better place that's when it turns into a tidal wave you know what i mean that's when it turns into change and you know hopefully hopefully it'll catch on more uh i've been trying um to not just me but uh i was talking to my buddy todd bean about it and and i was talking to clean canteen about it but implementing that same mindset and ethic in, in, in the touring. touring absolutely because but you think of the waste that goes on oh my god the touring I, I bands. can't even i it's mean crazy isn't it it's amazing it's amazing i mean every stop and again it's probably to, water like that's yeah. a big thing yeah and the problem is you know you get 12 people in a bus and you know every day there's six to ten cases of water showing up and it's there at everybody's disposal and half the time people will drink, drink half half or yeah. even take a sip or brush their teeth with it close it up put it down forget which one is theirs open up a new one yeah and it's a one-time thing it's gone it's waste and you know the amount of money and the carbon footprint that it takes you know to make one of those damn things and you know compared to you know i mean this this is new <laughs> you know in the sense that you know i mean uh it wasn't that long ago before none of us even or our parents 
even thought about buying water yeah <laughs> you just well i remember you that used to be the joke that you get called like a puff you know you get yeah. you, what are you drinking mineral water for it'd be yeah. like a very middle class like yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i mean so I what's mean, also brand new as well not brand new but I, th- I think i feel like there is a big wave and a big change happening is people's awareness and people's sense of responsibility and duty and i do feel like there's a national shift in consciousness yeah. at the moment towards recycling yeah. you know i don't know many people now who don't recycle in their homes yeah. and another big thing they're doing because i come from the bar trade originally is obviously straws are a big thing mm-hmm. and girls like to have straws so they don't get the lipstick mark on the glass and people are obviously light drink through straws because it's better for your teeth yeah. um, but now a lot of bars are removing straws from at least the front section of the bar and having them back so if people want a straw they've got to right. actually request one so oh. bars are doing their bit as well because straws yeah. must be another thing that sure you know, they end up in the ocean and sure and we have you know in california uh recently uh single-use plastic bags were banned which is wonderful it's brilliant and uh i've done a lot of uh, river cleanups and lake cleanups and i tell you uh it seems like about 80 percent of the garbage and trash that we picked up was always small things it was either the plastic bags that you get at a convenience store or when you go in and you know you buy a you buy a soda and a candy bar and a pack of smokes and they stick it in a plastic bag and get you know and uh uh you know plastic bags small plastic bits uh, the ring poles that go around cans of beer yeah yeah that's fast food containers you know what i mean and um you know these are the things that I feel like are really decimating this planet. And uh, I mean, I think recycling is wonderful, you know, but it there is also a massive carbon footprint to even recycle. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of argument out there that some people say that recycling to save the planet is actually worse for the planet in the sense of all the diesel that is is burned to operate the machinery to do it and to pick it up and yeah. the efforts and everything that goes into it some people are like oh it'd be better off just sticking in a landfill you know or burn it <laughs> whatever and so and, much of the responsibility then is on the consumer as well that's why I love this move from this company, Iceland. Like, it's up to yeah. the companies, isn't it? It's up yeah. to the businesses yeah. to say, okay, we're going to do our bit. Yeah. I mean, I love, you know, some of the bars uh, that I've noticed in the States and certain places. They're getting filter, uh, filter, uh, filtered water systems uh, in the bar that are just public. You know, there used to be water fountains everywhere, you know. You don't see as much of them anymore. I was in Australia reason. recently and they're everywhere yeah. there, but yeah. I, I really noticed them being everywhere because you walk around the UK and you never see them. You don't see them, yeah. And I mean, you know, it's, I mean, these businesses are, are just making hand over fist, you know, selling selling something that that should be free, you know? I mean, it, it should be. <laughs> And it is, it just needs to be cared for, you know, and cleaned, it, just like it was for generations before us. Uh, but, um, yeah, man, I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, that's that's a great step. I mean, you know, but we're, we're trying to hopefully, hopefully we can implement this in, in the touring world where it would, it would kind of lessen the footprint, you know. And hopefully make a make a little bit of a difference. Well, when you think about how many bands need to make a living through touring now, yeah. everyone does it, don't they? It's not like you make yeah. a record and then kick back and enjoy the royalties come flooding in. It's like yeah. you've got to get out there and make your money playing shows. Yeah. And if every band was to take on that approach, I think again the uh, the impact would be yeah for sure incredible for sure. What a good talk, Chuck. Yeah. I loved yeah. it, man. Um, yeah, can I ask you, before you go, I just want to sort of bring it home again. Tell me a little bit more about fatherhood and how that role has sort of, you know, changed your life for the better. And the- oh, for sure. 
the, the um, positive impact of being a dad. Yeah, it's it's the most wonderful and terrifying thing you can imagine. <laughs> you know, all put into one. You know, exciting and terrifying all at the same time. You know, it, just what we're talking about. You know, I'm I I this this kid is my hero. You know, I, I look at him and every every chance I get around him, I'm, I mean, I'm just overwhelmed with joy and admiration and it's one of those things where you know until until it happens it's hard to even fathom it but it's where i've realized you know this is why i'm here you know this is why i was born and you know recently uh last month i lost my father um which was just rough but at the same time you know every time i would uh every time i would break apart you know and kind of realize the reality that you know he's gone and all these duties now that we have to help my mother and and kind of make this transition and i would get beat up and just really upset and then and then i would turn around and i'd see a kid in his underpants with a bucket on his head and screaming and <laughs> running around tugging on my shirt you know i just had to laugh and kind of realize you know such as the, the circle of life the circle and cycle of life you know here it is you know out with the old and with the new and uh you know i i i think my dad would would laugh at that too you know i, I mean it's it's such a beautiful thing and um it made me uh just the whole process and and being there i was right there um helping out uh when he was born and you know help coaching my wife and just there holding her hand and and uh it all unfolded in front of me and it was the most intense amazing thing that i've ever experienced in my life and um i'm so just completely uh overwhelmed with how strong uh women are <laughs> it's they put us to shame is, don't they it is imagine bearing a human inside you for that long and then, amazing and that's just and, the work getting started isn't it oh my god and i mean you know there's there's truly a reason you know that that they they run this planet for sure um uh, i mean it i just have you know i i my respect and my love and my admiration grew for my wife so much more you know just during all this process and nobody ever nobody ever told me that you know uh when when it, everybody was just talking about the baby you know and then you know, I didn't even realize, like, wow, I'm I'm gonna fall in love with my girl all over again. You know, and uh, well, it's because you've made this amazing thing together, isn't it? Yeah. Right? It's like, yeah, if you imagine creating a song with someone that you respect and love and admire, times that by a thousand, that's kind of the process, isn't it? Because together oh, yeah. you've made something out of nothing, yeah, and you made yeah. the ultimate thing out of nothing, which is a life. Totally. And now he's at the age. His name's Grady Joseph, and uh, now he's at the age. He'll be he'll be three at the end of May, and uh, I swear, man, between the ages of two and three, the development that happens is astounding. I mean, it's just it's nonstop, nonstop, every day. And like we were talking about before about touring, and it's hard. I have been. I I went away. A weekend you know and I would come back and here's these new phrases and these new faces and these new this new humor and all these things that just overnight you know uh, but it's such a joy and and such an honor to just have an opportunity and uh, to me I just I just want to do the best I can, you know, and, and, you know, teach him everything that I know and, and encourage him to, you know, find even more knowledge after that and just keep fighting a good fight and be the best person he can be, you know, that's all we can do. Uh, but it's a, it's an absolute thrill and, um, 
huge responsibility and it can be terrifying, especially when you look around, you know, this world can be a pretty ugly, um, brutal place at times. And sometimes it's a little scary, you know, because right now he's just living in this, this beautiful bubble where just everything is wonderful, you know? And that obviously can't and, last forever. Yeah. And, and that hit me, uh, not long ago where I'm like, wow, you know, one day he's going to have his heart broken. One day he's going to, he's going to have his mind just twisted, uh, just completely confused, you know, of why people treat other people certain ways. You know, when he's growing up in just this beautiful world of just pleasant things and positivity and, you know, the, the outdoors and, you know, it's, that's, that's a little scary, but, but, you know, we take it one day at a time and, and, you know, deal with the rest later on. Put it there, dude. Thanks so much for a great chat. Thank you for coming on the show. Hey, it's my absolute pleasure, man. Thank really you. enjoyed it. And uh, very quickly, when is the sauce out and how can people get it? Oh, Chuck's well, got a new yeah. hot sauce coming out, people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, my some my brother and I and, and a couple of my dear friends, we, we launched a, a sauce company um, in 2014, but it, we jumped through a lot of hoops, but... Anyhow, we're finally there and we finally have it out and you can, you can order it online. Uh, the website is southmouthsauce.com. Um, southmouthsauce.com. Correct. Yeah. A little tip of the hat to the old Cajun family yeah. background. Is oh, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Southern cooking, home cooking. <laughs> and, uh, right now we have two sauces, um, and they're, they're hot sauces, but they're not, you know, we didn't want to do the whole burn your face off. Of yeah. Bread. We didn't want to do the kind of novelty, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. they're actually good. I mean, it's, it's good on tacos, pizza, eggs. It's great in uh, bloody Mary's. It's great. And you name it. And, uh, but we have a red and a green. The red is we call Americana sauce. And uh, the green is a, a really, really special kind of verde. It's called fried green tomato sauce. And, and both of them are on the kind of mild to medium scale. Um, if people are familiar with the Scoville uh, scale, it's more kind of like in the five to 8,000 on the heat level. But um, so they're mild to medium and uh but they're really good good flavors and uh good aftertaste and uh but anyhow we're doing that and people can order it online we're we're hopefully one of these days soon get a distributor over here where people don't have to pay so much for shipping because uh, the shipping's a little expensive assumedly people can buy them at your shows if they see you on tour yeah. Are you bringing them along to the gigs? Well, I haven't on this one, oh, but... Uh, well, by one, the time this goes out, the next time around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the <laughs> plan. That's the plan. I would love to be able to do that. Um, but again, you know, I need to find a distributor over here and figure out how to... Otherwise, you're traveling over with all your gear and then all this hot sauce. <laughs> shipping well. a pallet of, <laughs> pallet of bottles, yeah. <laughs> but but it's good, um, And but I, I encourage people to follow us along. Uh, you know, we have some, hopefully in this next year, even some more cool stuff that we're planning on bringing out. And uh, uh, But yeah, I'd appreciate the, sp the support. It's all grassroots, you know, DIY. It's good stuff. It's healthy. It's real food. It's not super just vinegar based you know but um yeah i mean it, it's all it's actually good for you <laughs> so. and i will say the new hot water music album it's obviously not brand new but it's still fresh and it's incredible um so i urge everybody listening to pick that up as well Thanks, um, man. is there a new one on the horizon or I, I know you guys like to take your time don't you yeah no yeah we do um you know what hit us a while ago that's kind of crazy is uh next year uh, 2019 will be hot water music's 25 year anniversary and uh we're planning on doing something i don't know right. what just yet but it all just kind of hit us recently where we're like oh my it's well it, it's a quarter of a century next year so 
that's a long time. So we're going to honor that. We'll we'll kind of recognize that somehow. I'm not sure exactly, but watch this space. Bit. Chuck <laughs> Reagan, good man. Great to see you. Have a good show tonight. My pleasure. And hopefully Thanks. see you again soon. Cheers, awesome. dude. I'm never going back. I'm never going back.